Would you please join me in welcoming, let's go one by one, the creator, writer, and director, Sam Esmail. And from the Alderson family, Rami Malek. Christian Slater. And Carly Chaikin. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Scott. So uh, thanks for having us. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you guys for being here. Yeah. Yes. Woo! Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Yeah. Just to let us know where you guys are uh, in terms of your own schedules with this show, without getting when we will see it. We'll come to more details about that later. But when did you guys return to production? Uh, what was it? End of February, right? End of February. End of February, yeah. Okay, and so, and then we'll, towards the end of this conversation, give a, a little more uh, hint about some stuff to come. But let me... Are you guys watching my story? <laughs> Just now, is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. What is going on? Yeah. yeah what's <laughs> I took over Mr. Robot's Instagram account today, so afterwards you guys can watch what we were doing before all this. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's. This is going to be sort of um, a look back at the entire run of the of the show, and so I want to really start at the beginning. Sam, why uh, the subject matter of a hacker, and was this? I've, we've heard about this being a, at one point a feature film. How did it end up the way it did? Um. Well, I really wanted to tell a story about Hacker because at the time I had been reading a lot about it in the news, but it wasn't it wasn't quite the public conversation, especially now. I mean, what was our tagline in the first season was our democracy has been hacked. That was before our democracy actually was hacked. <laughs> um, but so I didn't know we were marketing the future, but I really thought we were talking about something that was bubbling right underneath the surface, and I thought it was really important and I thought it was relevant. And and then you know, in terms of um, me writing it as a feature, it was that was my initial thought. And um, my mentor, who just who just passed away, Steve Golan, um, he had put on out this uh, little show called True Detective that that uh, winter, and he talked to me and uh, encouraged me to think about it as a TV show because I had gotten a little long-winded. <laughs> with the movie and so shocking um, yeah exactly <laughs> so uh so yeah that's how it how how we switched it to, to a tv show yeah can we just dig a little deeper though on the hacking thing did you have a student job at nyu i did wow you're really gonna bring <laughs> up all the past dirt so of course i wanted to be a hacker uh i was just really bad at it and um and at nyu to impress a girl i hacked into her college's mailing list and sent out this weird manifesto about how to not be a conformist and it was really dumb and i w i did it from the computer at the computer lab where i worked <laughs> and um so it was pretty easy to bust me and so i got fired and put on academic probation and i said i'll just write stories about hackers as opposed to actually be a hacker a little safer <laughs> um and when you were writing the s the script in any the you know the earliest forms, who did you imagine the audience would be for a show about hackers? Well, I didn't know. And honest, honestly, here's the thing: I, I, you know, I just knew I would like it. You know, I was a, I was a huge fan of that whole world and the whole subculture. But every time they made a movie about it, it was stupid. You know, and, it, and I and I was I still watched them. You know, hackers and swordfish and uh, you know, uh, but they're not they're not very good and they're not very representative of of what the a actual hacker subculture was. Um, and then when I wrote the script, I still felt like I didn't know if this was gonna break out in any way. And when we, when we started auditioning Elliot's, I really thought I had you know, a turkey on my hands. In fact, I, I actually talked to my producing partner, Chad, a lot about not pulling out, like not doing the show. This is just not good. I mean, this Elliot guy is really annoying. And, <laughs> and then Rami came in. And that, that's honestly what convinced me that maybe there's something here. Well, you tee up the next question, absolutely. 
Uh, I want to actually go down the line here and ask you guys how you first heard about this show from a guy we should note who at the time had never really worked in television before and for a network that had not really done this kind of darker uh, programming before. It was the whole Blue Skies concept, nothing wrong with that, but this was just very different. So I wonder, Rami, when you first, when this first crossed your radar, what went through your mind? Uh, well, the, the title, first of all, I was a, a little confused by. <laughs> uh, I thought, what, what's this going to be? And uh, then after just reading the opening for the show, uh, the first few pages, I was immediately hooked and knew I, uh, there was a, a very extremely talented writer at the helm of this. And then I just I just blew through it. I was I was hooked the way you're just reading anything that is um, uh, engrossing in a way you just stop looking thinking about it from a work perspective and and start thinking, wow, this is just entertaining. And then at the end of it, you get to a place and and I said well, I would love to do this. And uh, like you said, I, I knew that it was going to be at the USA Network, and I didn't know much about the USA Network. I mean, I knew a few shows, but I was quite honestly um, just uh, intrigued as to how it was going to be done on that network. And uh, I think they they took a great risk in making a show that I, I'm sure a lot of people thought might not be a, a cash cow per se or draw an immediate audience. It was a very unusual story about um, uh, a, a very unusual human being who does some very extraordinarily unusual things in his <laughs> life. And uh, I thought, listen, when I met Sam and Steve Golden and Chad Hamilton, I thought these guys do not make bad decisions. And this man has a very unique vision and can write like nobody else. And I could tell that I was uh, in, in the same space uh, encountering someone who was unique and, and extremely talented. And where he went, I was prepared to go as well. Yeah. And can we just share what your initial audition entailed? Because this was not a, you couldn't phone this one in, right? I mean, there was quite a bit of material. It was, it was the, the Fuck Society speech, yeah. the opening Ron's Coffee scene, and it was like, there was something else. It was like- It was three, the whole pilot. Yeah, it was basically, <laughs> can you do the yeah. first episode and then- <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, crazy. and it was a lot. It was a lot, but, and I think he, yeah. There were a lot of guys waiting outside, and I just said, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm going to get this. At that time, you know, TV shows, they, I, I don't think they represented our culture and the diversity of our culture the way that they perhaps do now. I'm like, I'm never going to play the lead in this show. They're going to go with the, the usual suspects. <laughs> so I just went in there and did, you know, my version of what I thought this guy was, and immediately I thought I had a pretty good handle on him. Uh, but we had to, yeah, we did, a, did this, the Ron's coffee scene, and that was probably... Who, who, who was the reader? Who, who read Ron's? So it was our casting director, oh, yeah? Susie. Susie yeah. Ferris. Yeah. Right. And it was weird. We were in Steve Gollan's office, which Steve Gollan, he likes to collect vintage art. So there's like this massive office with all this art, and you're sitting over there, and it's massive, and we're sitting really far away from you, and I don't know how you guys do it in general, but, um, and then we had to run all those scenes back to back, and one of those scenes, being the Fox Society scene, was basically just you doing a whole monologue. There's no one, you know, running lines with you, and I have to say, we brought in so many good actors. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say it was over 100 wow. solid good actors that came in and did a great job yeah. it just has to be that magical ch chemical thing that rami brought to elliot that um it's such a uh, a bullseye you have to hit and he he did it effortlessly right. mm, i got lucky with that writing i gotta say that when something is as well well written as it was it makes it so much easier it just makes you want to to do it as best you can give everything to it and 
it doesn't feel like acting anymore. It just it feels like it's just you're almost speaking in tongues. It's coming out of you because it's so well written and comes from a, such a soulful, honest place. Right. And that's how I mean everything I pick up of Sam's is that way. So that's the gift of it all. So Christian, were you familiar with Sam or Rami and their work prior to this? And also having been a part of a lot of great projects over the years, is this? Are you able to? Spot it right away yourself when it is one. Uh, <clears throat> not really. I mean, to, it's always a gamble or a risk. Uh, yeah, and there were elements in, in this one that, uh, uh, you know, led to questioning. And like we were saying, USA didn't typically do a show like this. So, um, you know, so there's always an element of anxiety going in. Um, Let me just quickly give a yeah. shout out to USA because yeah. they kind of, you know, uh, among uh, out of all the networks they did roll the dice yes they did on this one and was brave and honestly kept everything about the pilot intact i just want to say that shout out i wouldn't uh, would, this show would not be here without usa anyway go ahead chris and change television in a way as well yes totally yeah no absolutely sorry i interrupted oh go we ahead. love usa <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, but at the time, they had been doing uh, things in another way, and and, uh, and look, again, with the title, I picked up the script, Mr. Robot, I thought, oh, God, what is this going to be? I did Am not I gonna... know you guys hated the title so no, much. I didn't it, hate the title. It just was... I say USA? It, I don't, you it know. was different, you know? Yeah. It was, I thought, you know, in my imagination, I'd be playing like a butler and a, as an android. <laughs> yeah, you'd be lifting the thing up, and there'd be wires and shit, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> So uh, God, I didn't this, know. This is sounding pretty good. I kind of want to do this? that show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Robot Belvedere. That was going to be <laughs> me. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, uh, uh, and then I read the script and did, like Rami just said, you know, I mean, the writing was extraordinary and. Uh, you totally guessed the twist. That's right. No, we had our, we had our first meeting with Chad and, and, uh, and I just said, look, just. You know, tell me, what's the deal with this guy, you know? <laughs> is, is he really there? And uh, you were like, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah, you know, I'd be curious. And, and then you told me the, the deal. And, um, and yeah, I remember being so excited about that because that, too, was such an unusual thing to hear. You know, usually, you know, you play it safe and uh, you don't go for that. And, and uh, so, so this was, from, from the get-go, extraordinarily unique and and different, and Rami, um, I mean, I'd seen um, Night at the Museum, you know? Where, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, hey, this kid's pretty good. <laughs> uh. <laughs> He's perfect for Elliot, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, and I said, oh, you know, I think this kid's uh, pretty good. I think he's uh, maybe an up-and-comer, you know? So I was thinking. And, and, you know, so I just dove in, and, and you know, I remember the first day meeting you at my wardrobe fitting, and, and then we had to do the whole... We had to do the Ferris wheel scene. We had to do the Ferris wheel so scene. I feel like we... It really put us on the spot, I think. <laughs> I know. Right? Yeah. Because I think, I think literally you joined on a Sunday. Two days before. Yeah, on a Sunday, and then Tuesday we were doing the Ferris wheels. Right, right, right. So, and that was a long, well, beer again, a long winded scene. Uh, Yes. You know, I had a lot going on in it, and, uh, yeah, you had to sit down, and, and I felt like we were, you know, being you know, put to the test immediately. immediately. And uh, I think, yeah, it was, it was exciting because he had his part down, I had my part down. Well, it was only the two of you really on that. On that. That's right. Yeah, it was yeah. only the two of so us. So you guys, you guys I had off. I had, like, most of my part down because I only had, like, two days to get that right. scene into my head. I had everything down except, like, the last two lines. You know, I hadn't gotten had to, to keep that. keep rolling all, we had to do it all over again because of the right. Ferris wheel continuity. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was, it was great. Carly, um, you were coming off of a very different sort of show, and I think you were being considered for multiple parts here. I wonder if you can just share um, how you wound up as Darlene, but could have gone in a different direction. Right? Well, first I wasn't being considered for anything. <laughs> Look, I'm a, a big fan of Suburgatory, but, which is a great yeah. show, and she was great uh, in it. But I remember when Zizi came up to me and was like, you gotta consider her for Darlene. I was like, 
that person in Suburgatory? I, I had just, platinum I just blonde hair, a spray tan, was wearing like tight pink clothes and high heels. <laughs> so perfect, right? <laughs> That's exactly what you imagined. Um, yeah, thank God for Susie Ferris, who was our casting director. Um, rightfully so. They were like, this is weird and you don't have the same vision that we do. Um, but yeah, first they said Angela and then came back and said Darlene and I loved them both. So in the first audition I read for both characters, but Darlene always felt like more me. Um, and I remember, you know, that they were like USA and I was like, USA, I just watched like SVU reruns. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, so I was like, okay, what is this? And then I, I literally distinctly remember the day and moment that I read the script. And afterwards I shut my computer and just like sat there and was like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> and was like, walking to the movie with my boyfriend was like, could not stop talking about it. And it was just something so special. Um, you know, and Darlene has like one, you know, one or two lines in the pilot. But I remember for the audition, I got two scenes from episode two. Um, but I just, it was, yeah, it was really incredible. I want to come back to something that Ronnie referenced a little earlier about just the um, unusual uh, casting of this, of a lead. It, it was not common to have, um, you know, your non, non-white lead of a show, period. Um, and, and Sam and Rami, I, I, I guess this wasn't necessarily realized by you guys at first, but both of Egyptian descent, both first-generation Americans. And um, I wonder if you can each talk about that because uh, Sam... I'm just going to read you back one thing that I read you said in another interview that I thought was interesting. Quote, I tend to write about alienated figures who can't connect with others and who are kind of distant from American culture. It's not something I'm consciously doing, but it's something that happens to be infused inside me because of my experience growing up in America. Close quote. Um, can you just maybe expand on that? I think that's really interesting. Well, let me just say, I didn't actually know you were Egyptian during the audition, so that had no bearing... Right. Uh, on casting Rami, I just thought he was perfect for the role. And then when we found out, I mean, we, we kind of had this weird, because it was like a bunch of similar things. Our fathers had just passed away, like roughly around the same time. And um, and uh, we were ber both first generation Americans. But um, but but that that part of it never, I never wanted, I mean, and this is, a, I think this is the type of thing that when you deal with a lot of, the casting for diversity in shows, it's a thing that feels a lot like homework to a lot of people, where in this case, it, it was just the, the right person for the right role and it had nothing to do with that. And I think there is that weird, and it's a conversation that's continually happening right now where you don't need to be defined by a race, but that you could still, but, but that could inform the character, but you could still tell a story that's as universal as, any, as, as anyone else. And so I think for me, um, that was never like, I was never a big deal. I mean, it was never something that we had to like cater to. I remember there were conversations about, well, should we, should we change his name from Elliot? And, and it was like, wh why? I just never understood that. So it's a, it's a, we, in a weird way, I kind of just ignored, ignored that part of it. And Rami, from, from your perspective, can you just, you know, I understand that this was not, as Sam's saying, it was not like a necessarily a concerted effort to not cast, uh, you know, any type of person or to cast the type of person, but you had been coming off of years of experiences where this kind of, you know, where, where ethnicity and things had come into play. Yeah, I mean, I played a pharaoh and Night at the Museum. <laughs> and I think a few terrorist roles uh, prior to that. And I just, at some point, one point, put my foot down and said, that's gonna be it for that. And uh, I, yeah, and that was a great decision because I would get you know, offers of that nature and you constantly desire to work as an actor, but there are things you realize, uh, well, that's not worth it. I'm not representing myself or the community well and perpetuating uh, an idea of what this culture is like so 
Let's find another way to do it. And when you hear a, a name of a character called Elliot Alderson, you think, are they gonna are they gonna be okay with Rami Malek playing that role? Probably not at that point. But you know, you give it a shot, and and in this circumstance, it worked. And uh, I think it was a very very powerful move on your part to keep it as Elliot Alderson. I w as an a I thought to myself when I went back, are they gonna change the name? How do I? How, um, would I be okay with them changing the name? At least let's keep Elliot, but hopefully they'll keep Elliot Alderson. And, you know, Sam was very steadfast about not changing the name and very steadfast about his vision throughout. And what would have they done about me? I don't, I, I honestly just, Right? They actually told me. I mean, me I'm very white. <laughs> <laughs> Carly, it was Carly Kardashian. <laughs> Yeah, it was all brought up, and I just continually ignored it. Because ultimately, is that important? Is that really a factor? I mean, you have a year later, uh, Hamilton comes out, and you know, and it's Aaron Burr is played by an African American, and um, Alexander Hamilton is played by someone of color. It's a, it's not it, to me. It was a, it kind of an, one of the most irrelevant irrelevant topics to even go into. And literally, though, because you don't, I don't think Elliot's family, ethnicity, or uh, religion, or anything ever even comes up, does it? No, no, yeah. it doesn't. Um, I would like to now, so everybody's now at this point in the chronology on board. What, it sounds like, Christian, you only had two days to get your act together, literally, but for um, Carly, for Rami, w were there things that you felt you could, you should do beyond knowing the script, which was no small task here, but to, like, you know, research into any of the topics that were applicable to Elliot or Darlene or any of, any of that stuff. What were you doing to get ready? Well, I bought this hacking book and then <laughs> and I was like, what are they talking about? And then um, my fiance's dad bought me hacking for dummies. <laughs> and then I was like, I was really interested in it, interested in it because it's, you know, it's a whole other language and like learning a foreign language. And everybody asks that, but then I'm like, they come to us and I'm just pressing random things on a keyboard that's all already pre-programmed. So I'm like, I don't really need to know how to hack. Um, but I think too, you know, I never did research on like the hacking culture necessarily. I listened to some stuff about um, different hacks and cool things that people did. But I think that one of the cool things about our show is that it kind of changes the view of hackers and hacking culture and what a hacker looks like. Um, and you know that it's not, people have this idea that it's like someone in the basement of their mom's house, like sitting at the computer. So I'm always, you know, was down to create like our own thing of here's like a cool girl who is really smart and a great hacker. And I read that one of the things that you know, has consistently appealed to you about about your character, just to follow up on that, is like, at no point is she any of the things that most characters, young women, are have the opportunity to play these days are. There's, she's never a damsel in distress. If anything, she's got other people by the balls. Uh, I mean, it's 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 sort of a breath of fresh air for, for you for in terms of what's out there, right? Yeah, I think it's it's really cool to play one, a woman in tech and representing that. Um, you know, and we had actually recently talked about that every hack Elliot ever did, you know, needed my help too. And so it wasn't always, you know, it's like we've always needed each other. Um, but yeah, to play someone who of course is flawed and of course still like needs people there for her, but is so strong on her own and smart. And so it's really cool to play that and not play, you know, a stereotypical female character that I see now are starting to change, though, in the right direction. Yeah. And Rami, though, for you, did you, I think um, you're, you're, you've got to be grappling not only with the, the hacking, coding side of everything, but also this guy's got quite a few, uh, I don't know if disorders is the proper word, but certainly some challenges. Wait, I need to say, call Rami out on something really fast. Why? He could. Why? <laughs> In fact, why 
Why don't you? Why don't okay, you? never mind. <laughs> oh. I'm not the most technologically proficient <laughs> human being, and she's probably going to say it a little bit. He could barely <laughs> type on a keyboard. <laughs> I'm not a millennial who can just bang everything out at 100 words per minute. Um, yeah. So do you have a, you have a hand uh, double? Well, no. <laughs> I, I just don't always hit the appropriate, appropriate keys, keys. <laughs> uh, as often as I should. Um, yeah. Well, that was, you know, there were a number of things that I wanted. I, I thought the technological aspect was going to be secondary because emotionally this guy had a lot to deal with. And I told this story before, but I was getting my hair cut and uh, my barber was talking about his wife, uh, who is a psychologist, and I was telling him, we were talking about the show that I was working on, preparing to do, and... Uh, he offered her phone number up and I would call her and talk about Elliot pr over and over and over and to the point where I introduced her to Sam and uh, after what, the pilot or yeah. during season no, one? No, it was after the pilot. Yeah. I think it was like during the pilot actually and then and now she's been our consultant on the, in the writer's room for the last, for the, uh, the entire show. But I, I, I would talk to her over and over about things uh, that Elliot was dealing with, trying to diagnose him, read books about schizophrenia and uh, uh, DOD, dissociative, uh, DID, dissociative disorder. And uh, ultimately, I never wanted to exactly, and anxiety, I never wanted to pin down one thing as as to what Elliot was going through, a number of things. Never wanted to ostracize anybody who felt like they could relate to him. Um, so that, that was extremely helpful. Another thing, physically what I did in the city was just day after day put the black hoodie on and put on some black uh, shoes and... and, and pants and walk around with my backpack and just keep my head down, not talk to people, try not to make eye contact or sometimes make a little too much eye contact, uh, but go to the grocery store and try to not look up and pay without even communicating with the cashier, which is not like me. I'm, I like Very to like me. <laughs> <It's very> <laughs> like. <laughs> and, uh, and I found that terribly lonely i'm sorry <laughs> but it was extremely helpful I, mean, I would get into elevators and not communicate with anybody you would, you would not touch that you would try I, and i would try to not touch anybody not touch walk to a, a closer to the building side of the street than the outside to, to just keep uh, avoid as many people as much human contact as i could yeah. and i get into elevators and try to find the camera in the elevator i was just trying to do what Elliot would do and, you know, hide from the world. And I found it to be a very lonely place. And uh, only recently, because uh, things have changed in my life, I find myself doing that, having to do that more and how lonely that is, is walking down the street, keeping my head down. Yeah, you know how this goes. Very sad. <laughs> right? You just walk around and just keep your head down because otherwise, I mean, there are moments where you want to say hi to everybody and there are moments when you just got to get to from point A to point B and I'm like, oh, I just got to stare at the ground and get there, which sucks. But it's also part of all of this and I'm very privileged and blessed to have this in my life. So it's just a small price to pay, but Interesting. I'm always, I'm always going to be living a part of Elliot's life. Yeah, now, now. you're... <laughs> um, well, one of the, th you know... Elliot slash Mr. Robot do some very unsympathetic things, and yet the audience, I think, is always um, in, in, ultimately under, fundamentally rooting for, for Elliot. And I want to, I think, just one theory is that the voiceovers are really important to that because I think you inherently empathize with whoever is telling you their the story through their eyes and i just want to ask uh sam you know how those evolved and you know the how you feel they the the function you think they serve in the in the whole series 
Well, the voiceover was the first thing that I wrote. I think I wrote all of the voiceover before I even started thinking about the story because the first thing that I think about when I go to write anything is who am I writing this about, you know, and who is this person, and I really want to get into their head, and that's why I love voiceover because it's, it's a direct line to their thoughts, their feelings, and even to the thoughts and feelings they want to hide from other people, to the thoughts and feelings they want to hide to them from themselves. Um, but that's the tricky part because I knew that this to stay genuine to what I thought would to, to, to formulate a character that's going to be in this position that's going to want to do something as reckless as hack a corporation and steal or take down all their data. Um, that has to be a very specific person. It, it, it's not going to be a person that's just extremely likable on the surface that's easy to root for. It's got to be somebody who's complicated, who's nuanced, who has a lot of anger towards what's going on right now. And that, by the way, is where I think the rooting interest started, is that, you know, this is 2015. Imagine the show coming out today. I mean, there's a lot of anxiety about what the world is going through right now. And I think Elliot tapped into that. Um, but I will say, and I brought, I said this earlier, the added thing to that, the, the reason why I think a lot of people have this rooting interest is because of this guy. I mean, again, I saw great actor after great actor tackled those scenes and, and, and they did it exceptionally well. But Rami just brought a vulnerability and warmth to it that I think was hard to, it was hard to not connect to that. That was something that's a piece of us, I think all of us, that we can kind of universally say, I feel that way sometimes. I know what that person's going through and that's what Rami Malek did. Can I ask a question? That's what he did. And taking over, <laughs> let's go, uh, going off script. But I'm so curious because what you just said about now, like how different do you think the show would be if you wrote it now and it came out it, it the first time It would be cute today? now, right? It'd be like quaint now. It's kind of <laughs> quaint now. I mean, I mean, I think about that with a lot of shows like Veep. I mean, I don't, would Veep even exist if it started now? It'd be kind of pale in comparison to... To, to what's happening in real life. But the weird thing is, I think that's why our timing was so weird. I mean, our, again, I go back. The tagline was our democracy, uh, our democracy has been hacked. That was our first season ta you know, tagline. And then a year later, it happens, you know? And I think there was a lot of things that were in the writer's room. We continue, we do this today, to even this season, we are continually let the current events sort of inspire us because that's what we feel passionately about. That's what feels relevant. And it's sort of, at the time, hacking was just sort of right underneath the surface, bubbling. And then literally the day we got picked up, the Sony hack happens. Mm -hmm. The day we got picked and then And then, again, a year later, I don't have to tell you guys, you witnessed it, you know? It happened in our general election. Um, and, 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 you know, all the other stuff. The Ashley Madison thing know. happened like a couple weeks before that episode aired, so the person being killed on the air on the, TV, uh, yeah. many different. Like we could go on and on. It's like Assange and Snowden and all of that coming to a head during, during the run. It's unbelievable. But I think that's part of the reason why, again, I think people connected to the show is that there w we wanted to talk about now. I mean, the show is still set in 2015 for that reason. Is that we wanted it to be? We didn't want it to be dated. I mean, with tech. With movies about tech, it's always going to eventually be dated, right? Like you know, the computers and the phones are going to change with every so every few years. But we want it, so we we specifically said this is about now. This is about 2015, but it but so it's almost like a period piece of current day, and we and that was a really important thing to us. Did you know at the start of the process how the show was going to end? Yes, right from the very beginning. And it and it is ending that way. Okay. Um, I want to ask Carly and then Christian about some of the amazing uh, monologues, I guess would be the word, almost like soliloquies that come that, that you guys all at one time or another have had to deliver. I just, you know, you, you think about, and and it's it's many actors on the show, even people that we, we don't see as often as you guys, where, I, you know, there's a discussion about the banking holiday when Roosevelt came into office and how put, you have, there's no confidence without the con and all of these really thoughtful but also, 
you know, often uh, lengthy monologues for you guys to have to deal with. I wonder, what are those like to, how do you, how do you approach learning them? And then what are they like to, to deliver? We got some doozies in season four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, pl but tell us, like, honestly, just to take us inside the actor's process of, you see that on the page, is it exciting, scary? How do you learn it? All well, that. Carla, you just even, did one. Yeah, I did a page and a half thing in the middle of the street. <laughs> it was very fun. In the middle of the yeah, in the night. Yeah. Um, you know, season two, I had, it was kind of broken up in the edit, but it was like a two-page story that I'm telling Cisco about when I was younger. That was like just two pages of text. Um, but to me, that's so fun because you just really like get to know the story and the words kind of are second. But for acting wise, it's impossible to say something genuinely when you have no idea what you're talking about, which is like half the time I read some tech line, we're not even pronouncing it correctly. Um, and so it's been really interesting to learning all that stuff because I'm like, what does this mean? So in that process, I've also got to understand like when I'm going through all this crazy jargon that's like German to me um, of like learning what I'm actually saying is really fun. But I think, you know, the more the merrier you get to really like get into the meat of things as an actor and um, just tongue twisters. Christian, do you have a technique? for and doing that? I do, I do. Um, I, I record everything and, and listen to it as I walk down the street or wherever the heck I am, and, and that helps in the repetitiveness. Next time you see him, steal his headphones. Yeah, yeah that'll really <laughs> mess me up for work. Um, but yeah, the other day I, uh, I misread the call sheet, <laughs> and I, uh, I thought, you know, I, I, I read the wrong scene for the day, and, and uh, got to work and realized, you know, because usually when I see like a lot of dialogue, I'm, I'm very excited, you know? I'm like, oh, goody, I get to talk today and this is a challenge and, <laughs> and, uh, and it's really fun. Um, but this day I was not happy because, you know, I didn't know any of it. So um, uh, fortunately, uh, you know, I'm surrounded by a great team. And uh, this guy, uh, we spent the whole day just, uh, you know, beating our heads against the wall. So a lot of it comes down to like the team you're working with and, and uh, you know, the help you get around you. Well, and, and lest anyone, you know, think that it's it's all, you know, dialogue, should they not, or monologues, had, had they just been discovering the show today. I love what you guys do with silences too. I think the most striking uh, element is in the, or one that stands out, is when we find out about uh, Shayla and the way that that's all played and, and unfolds and all of that. So um, with something like that, Sam, and even with a decision like the framing of the, of the you know, camera, the way you, that's very distinct. What, what do you, is that all pre-scripted or that's a decision on the day or how do you, how do you, how did that end up being the case? Well, the framing was something that I talked about um, from the get-go of how I wanted to shoot this film. And it was honestly something that was influenced a lot by British cinematography. At the time, the shows that I, I, I was obsessively watching, shows like Luther and Broadchurch, and they had similar cinematography and this sort of off-kilter uh, framing that always put this sort of unsettling feeling when you're watching it, and you're kind of like you know, the characters are kind of being swallowed by this environment. And I thought thematically that tied perfectly into what we were trying to do with Mr. Robot. And in general, I think sort of how I view the world when, especially when we're talking about the sort of paranoid thriller genre. Um, and yeah, we try, like, there are a lot, of, that's why I love long takes. I, you know, I hate, uh, you know, unless it's really called for it, I actually don't love frenetic cutting. A lot of times when I go to action films or, or, uh, or, or uh, any of these blockbuster films, you know, it's so, it, the action sequences become so incoherent because I have no idea where anything is in it. And so I lose my emotional investment. And I find that when you stay with a shot as long as possible, when you have brilliant actors in front of that shot, like what we did with Carly, that scene is a oneer. We didn't cut. It was one take and she's delivering a page and a half of dialogue. Um, 
it, there's something about it that just lets you be with that person, whether it's with dialogue or with silences, like at the end of that episode where that was also a one -er. Um It's almost like you're not blinking. You just, and you can't look away. You just have to be with that person as they're going through whatever they're going through. And I think that's powerful. And we try and use, do that, lean into that as much as possible. That's great. With the writer's room, are you, because there are so many unconventional twists and turns and fake outs in a sense and whatever are you working it how does what is your, do you have a somewhere like a room that looks like a beautiful mine with <laughs> with just everything connect, like how how do you map it out well the thing is is that like like i said earlier the ending is the ending right we we were always building up to that from the first season and so it's all about finding a way to get to that ending in in a in a way that earns us that place because i think you know, the, our compass has always been Elliot's journey, and everything sort of folds around that. Um, so it's not about trying to find puzzles and tricks and, and ways to fake people out, or any, it really isn't. It all just starts with how does Elliot um, feel about this, and that motivates everything else. Um, I know there was a lot of talk in season two about that whole reveal and whether we were just going for gimmickry, but at the end of the day, what started that conversation in the writer's room was how does Elliot feel about this? How does Elliot feel about the audience? And that's really where all those ideas are born out of. One of the, since, since the beginning of season two, you have directed every single episode. Rami, the, the, I know that was something you were very happy could be the case, that Sam would be directing everyone. It also, though, came with one shift in the way you guys shot the show, right? In the sense that now, unlike season one, what is block shooting and how does that affect your job? Well, so in order for Sam to direct every episode, we have to shoot the entire season as if we were doing a film. Uh, one long I don't know, maybe 12, 13, 14 hour film. And so as you do in a film, you don't shoot everything in sequence. I mean, I mean, it's very rare when you do. So we can be shooting something from uh, the first episode of season four and the final episode of season four in the same day. And that can be quite traumatic. But when you have, uh, when you have something who you, someone who you implicitly trust that not only is the visionary behind the show but has written it knows exactly where we're going as he said from day one knows the ending of this uh that's the only way i would sign up to do it in this fashion is to to have someone uh there is no one like sam so to have sam <laughs> uh leading the charge and uh you can come in as prepared as you want but I will miss things uh, n undoubtedly that I, that you you do as as you're struggling to compile this many episodes and perform them uh, as this long series and always Sam will redirect me in the in the right place and uh, remind me of all the circumstances as he does all of us so that's what you you come in with knowing that you have someone there who has your back throughout and will will never let you fail to give you guys perspectives yeah. a movie is like 120 pages that they do where our movie is basically like 600 pages yeah. and you get it all at the and we're doing it all yeah yeah throughout like a few you know these six months so christian yes. do you have again from having done a lot of movies that are done in the same out of uh, you know out of sort of sorts way is there a way for you do you like to sort of map it out in some way so that you know if you're coming in on you know episode seven and then going to episode two just how to keep track of where you want to be emotionally or in, in terms of intensity or any of that again you know like uh, Rami said it is I was thrilled when uh, Sam said he was going to direct every episode I mean even in the first season, he was uh, he was around uh, all the time, so it was very helpful because to keep track of 
you know, who, who Mr. Robot is and who the dad is and the separation between those two and uh, making sense of that um, was, was tricky. Because, uh, you know, I had a pretty clear idea about who Mr. Robot was. So None of those directors oh. knew that I was, like, his sister or that, you know, who you really Spoiler were. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah. I know everyone's seen the first season. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, um, yeah, and it was very different. You know, we did have a different director every week, and we were doing each individual episode. And, like, in that first season, none of us knew what the whole season was going to look like. So when it would come to doing the read-throughs of those episodes every week, you know, I was particularly like, what? You know? I would get very excited and, and uh, you know, couldn't believe. And when it came to reading episode, uh, maybe it was eight or nine, I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm dead, you know, that's it. Uh, I mean, I called Sam, I was like. He was very concerned. I was like, look, it's been great. Uh, I've enjoyed this. I very told you a number of times, you're coming back and you just didn't believe yes, it. Yes, but I am an actor, you know. <laughs> You're typically nutty people, so um, so yeah. So uh, you know, having him there has just been uh, great. I want to ask you guys about, and anyone should jump in who feels like it. Um, some of the more memorable, more out there things, such as um, season. I want to get the numbers right. Season two, episode six with the, which basically is like, it unfolds like an 80s sitcom. It was, fun, it was yeah. so unexpected and outside the box. Maybe, Sam, if you could just, why? And then <laughs> you guys, what it was like to do that. Well, again, it, it starts from Elliot's emotional journey, and that's what that conversation was about, that the end of the prior episode, um, Elliot was uh, being beaten brutally by Ray and, 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 and his men. And, um, and we wanted to show how Mr. Robot steps in and protects Elliot in those instances. And so we thought, well, Mr. Robot will take over and then Elliot will go somewhere. And the somewhere was, well, where is that? We, at first we were gonna be with Mr. Robot, but we thought, well, wait a minute, what's the, in the interesting thing here is, how do we stay with Elliot? What does that look like? What is that world? And then when we started to throw around ideas about, well, what's Elliot's safe place, his comfort place? And I remember growing up, it was TGIF. I mean, used to watch all those shows, Step by Step, and Perfect Strangers, and Full House, and Growing um, Pains. Was that Growing one Pains? Too? And uh, yeah, and what's the one with uh, Alex P. Keaton? Fa family Fa ties. Family ties, and um, it, there was just something about those shows that, especially again, growing up as uh, as as a kid of immigrants, that that show there was a slice of normalcy that I didn't have. And so, um, and so that's how it kind of the conversation started about well, Elliot's safe place is one of those sitcoms that he remembers so fondly as a kid. It looked fun to play. I mean, for you guys, was that it was a, hilarious. hilarious? And we, oh, it was we, so we shot it like right. yeah. exactly like that yeah. show would be shot. Right. We had the three cameras set up. I mean, the backdrop, and I mean, it was it was unbelievable. We all felt pretty freaky doing <laughs> it. You know, it was, and then to, of course to have. That little frickin' puppet come running around was uh, Alf. Uh, Alf. the nicest Christian. guy Alf. ever. <laughs> no, I didn't want to give it away. That's oh, all. Oh. Just in now case. Now we're doing spoiler alert. Oh, <laughs> Retro. Yeah, all the things. Believe me, that's a real twist. It still feels weird saying I'm your sister. Like, I still feel like I'm doing something wrong because I was so paranoid about it. Strangely, that. you guys look a lot. I mean, there's just features that you guys share. It's it's really incredible. Like the casting is just phenomenal. You both have giant eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go to season three, episode five. All in one continuous shot. How did that? How did that work? Yeah. Well, again, that that conversation started with Elliot's emotional journey. So at the end of the prior episode, he had kind of come back in uh, witnessing Angela and and Mr. Robot and Terrell working together and then and then he uh, and then he gets kind of taken out by Angela and so the next episode I wanted to be with him in real time 
as he starts to remember because i i thought to myself would he would he know right away or would it just be this sort of nagging thing in the back of his head and if i could be with him as for a, every second of those thoughts as he's as he's trying to piece it together as he's trying to remember it's almost like you're waking up from a dream and you're still trying to hold on to well what actually happened um was that a dream you know what sometimes when you wake up and you think the dream was real and you're in that kind of hazy phase that's what I wanted uh, the uh, beginning of the episode to, to uh, feel like. So that's where the real, the, the kind of real time aspect uh, came into play. And then we were gonna actually, halfway through the episode, we were gonna actually start cutting when we switched point of views to Angela. But at a certain point we were like, no, this makes sense. Even the Angela side of the story felt more tense and more, um, more impactful if we stayed with her in real time. So that's, that's kind of how, yeah, that and whole USA episode. aired it without. Aired, I mean, again, I gotta give it, give them credit. No commercials, um, and they aired it straight through. And, and um, honestly, half the stuff, just even doing the sitcom episode, I just kept waiting for them to fire me. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and the commercials and, for that, and too. And the commercials for that. So instead, what they didn't, they, they didn't fire me, thankfully. Thank you, ESA. And instead, what they did was they were so excited, they went out to advertisers, and they were able to air actual old at commercials from the 80s and 90s. Um, so, yeah, they, they've been... Surprised I wasn't in one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I did, like, you bet your lifesavers, you know? <laughs> All this kind of crap, yeah. That's great. I I just started watching The Office. I'm so late to the game, and it is, yeah, terrific. The best though. show ever, aside <laughs> from Mr. Robot. Yeah. <laughs> and I caught you in it yesterday. Yes. Have you ever you, tasted a rainbow? That was yes. <laughs> oh, so oh, you make me laugh. Yeah, so we have just a, a few minutes left, and I want to ask you a, each about how your job has sort of changed over the now going into this or in the process of now being in the fourth season of doing this. Um, Carly, we have certainly seen a lot of changes in Darlene's life and uh, fashion and everything's changed a lot for this character um, in terms of growing into playing her and then seeing where she's gone. What can you tell us about that? I mean, I've been really lucky with my character and, and each season being able to do something different and growing with her instead of kind of having a repeat of doing the same thing all the time and of really getting to go on this journey with her and seeing her growth each season and the change um, and seeing all these different parts of her has been really amazing to actually like know every level of who she is. Um, and you know it's also interesting and in, like life imitates art that like there's just been so many similar you know parallels between what she different things she feels in her life in the same stages in mine but um you know i think what's so great about this last season too is that we really get to s it's like you get to see where they go and and kind of all those loose ends tied up and seeing the payoff for each character, and, and it's been amazing playing her, and I'm gonna miss her so much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Christian, from starting out where I think you guys literally had to tell other actors, don't look at, don't look at me, basically, <laughs> to now- Some outtakes of that. Yeah, <laughs> and now getting to actually, as, as the disintegration, I think, is the words that you guys have used, as that's increasingly the case, you are now acting opposite directly a lot more uh, other actors maybe than were, was the case before just what's uh, what's this trajectory been like for you uh it's been incredible uh i mean the the mystery of the character certainly in season one the uh anger and rage of the character in season two um the fighting for control uh season three i mean just the the separation you know who's going to be in charge and then to get to a point of uh, finally uh, working together by the end of season three uh, has been has been great so um, you know and yeah it's true uh, uh, this season uh, uh, I do become a little bit more uh, real to a certain degree and and uh, that's been that's been very interesting because I, I love working with other actors and you know uh, 
you know, working with Rami is, is great, but it's been nice to kind of, you know, <laughs> I'm with you. bounce off some other, you know, some other people. She's great. Uh, Martin's great. Um, so, yeah, no, I just, I, I love all these guys. Rami, uh, both the journey of the character I'd love to hear about, and also, you know, it was alluded to a little bit earlier, but, you know, you've picked up some hardware in the last year. Your, your whole life is... <laughs> And that's on the heels, I didn't even mention earlier, I don't know how, of uh, becoming one of the youngest best actor in a drama Emmy winners ever as well. Uh, first non-white winner of that category in 18 years. And then, then this little thing, the Oscar as well. Just this whole journey of how things have changed in the four years of being associated with Mr. Robot. Uh, yes, things have changed and they, they just w wouldn't have happened this way without this role in this show and this group. Uh, that was, I'd done some, some things I thought were special in the past and they still are, but uh, this show gave me, uh, uh, just put me, put me in a position where people could see what I was capable of doing in a phenomenal series that uh, I think not one, I, I will say, it did revolutionize the way we looked at tele television on cable, uh, this show did, and it revolutionized how we looked at uh, who could, who the characters we wanted to follow were, and what they had to say, and uh, it gave me, it just gave me a platform to run the gamut of emotions that I, a character could, could play. I mean, over one season, I thought, what is left for him? And now over four, I, uh, I think it's going to come to a, a phenomenal end. I can't obviously say how, <laughs> but it's been an extraordinary experience and I would never have uh, had the opportunities that I, I had without this show. I only got Bo Bohemian Rhapsody because the producers had seen me on uh, Mr. Robot playing Elliot, and I don't know how they thought that that guy was going to play Freddie Mercury. <laughs> but ha had this show not existed, that would not have happened, and everything else since then. So it has been uh, the greatest experience with the greatest people, and I will be so sad when this is over. I, mean, I, I do scenes with these kids now, and uh, I've always looked at Carly in scenes as Darlene, and it's really, really difficult not to have moments where uh, I just see Carly, and that's because we're we're we are like brother and sister now because of this, and uh, and Christian and I are trying to savor every moment of this, and Sam and I are setting up lunches so we can ha really enjoy a every second of this as well, and just really trying to savor it because, as Christian told me early on, things like this, they just really don't happen, and you know, you've seen it all. So from the very beginning, I, I had the, the privilege of getting you know, that insight as to how rare something like this is. And it is very rare to work with such talented people. Our crew is phenomenal. And uh, to be led by this guy, I've, I've had the privilege of working with some extraordinary directors. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot tell you how talented, how gifted, and how giving this human being is. And it's rare. People say some shit about Hollywood. <laughs> Not when you got this guy around. And before we uh, close with Sam, I just want—I don't want anyone to worry that if they've not been, you know, paying attention to the news the last week, I don't want them to worry that you haven't found additional work since uh, Mr. Robot. Can you give us a little tease about what you might be doing next? I'm going to be trying to take down Daniel Craig right. in, <laughs> in the next Bond movie. <laughs> what happened to my life? Right. <laughs> All right, yeah. so... Uh, Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. <laughs> did you know that? I did, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I sent you a text. I was like, dude, this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. Um, all right, so Sam, appropriately enough, I would like to ask you if you can, uh, you know, give your just overall reflections. And also, cool news, we're going we're gonna to break some news today about season four. Oh. Um, 
they just want to know the news. They just want to know about the show. So I'll just jump ahead. So basically, going back to my earlier comment about being a fan of British television, um, typically how they wrap up their series is, is anyone here a fan of British television? Do you know what they typically do at the end? Like the British office, which, I'm, you know, they you tend to do a Christmas special. And so the final season of Mr. Robot is one very long Christmas special. It'll last over uh, uh, about a week over Christmas of 2015. So that's, that's Get the ready, final coming in later this year. Later this year. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for doing this. Thank you for coming, and uh, thank you for coming. Stay thank tuned. you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks for being the greatest fans over all these years. Thank yeah, you, thank you for being here, and you guys have made the show what it is. We appreciate yeah.